Hey you guys. All right, so yesterday we talked about gas behavior just in very sort of general descriptive terms. We looked at kinetic molecular theory as a model for explaining the behavior of gases. And um, in that conversation, I introduced you to four of the variables that are really important to us um, in order to measure and describe the behavior of gases. And those variables are pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. Our job today is to look at the actual mathematical relationship between these variables. And instead of just giving you the key equation, even though you already know it, I think it'd be more fun to derive it. So the people that are doing the demos in school today, they're observing these relationships um, firsthand. And you guys will do that next week um, as well. But for now, we are relegated to a few videos here that we're going to watch together, looking at the relationship of pressure to all of these other variables. Like what is the relationship between pressure and volume, pressure and moles, and pressure and temperature? If we can figure out these relationships, we can actually derive an equation from that. You know, sometimes I think you guys think that, you know, these brilliant scientists just like dream up the equations in their sleep, but that's not really how most science gets done. Like most equations are actually derived by observing relationships in nature and looking at how those relationships can be quantified or related mathematically. So let's do that. Let's watch a couple videos together. Um, the first video we're going to watch is going to look at the relationship between pressure and volume. Experiment is take your small balloon in your large syringe and drop the balloon inside the syringe and place the plunger on the end. For our first test, place the plunger at the highest point in the syringe and cover the bottom opening with your finger. Next, press the plunger down and watch as the balloon shrinks in size. Remove your finger from the bottom of the syringe to release the pressure. For the second test of our experiment, we're going to place the plunger at the lowest point it can be without touching the balloon. Once again, place your finger over the opening in the bottom of the syringe and pull the plunger upwards. Watch as the balloon increases in size. To release Okay, so that was kind of fast. What you were seeing is, is in that closed system when his finger was on the end of that syringe and he pushed down on that syringe, when he increased pressure, the volume of the balloon went down. And in reverse, when he pulled on the syringe and decreased the pressure inside that container, the volume of the balloon increased. Let's take a quick little look at this in terms of what's happening at the molecular level. They have a cute little diagram down here at the end of the video. In our experiment, the balloon and syringe are filled with tons of gaseous air molecules. Placing your finger over the opening at the bottom of the syringe keeps the mass of air molecules constant and creates a closed system that will allow us to manipulate the pressure and volume. When we press the plunger down, we are increasing the pressure being placed on the air molecules inside the syringe by reducing its volume. As the pressure increases, the amount of force placed on our air molecules increases and they are forced closer and closer together, decreasing the volume of space that our gas takes up and shrinking the size of our balloon. When we remove our finger from the bottom of the syringe, we release the added pressure and our balloon grows back to its original volume. In the second portion of our experiment, we start with the plunger at the bottom of our syringe, almost touching the balloon. When the plunger is pulled upwards, we are reducing the pressure inside the syringe by increasing the volume of space the air inside takes up. This decrease in pressure and increase in volume pulls the air molecules further apart, increasing the amount of space the gas takes up, growing and expanding the size of our balloon. Removing your finger from the bottom of the syringe returns the pressure back to normal, reducing the volume and size of our balloon. When we Okay, so let's go back to our notes here and write that down. All right, so the demo that we saw showed that when the experimenter increased the pressure on that syringe, well, on it and in it, right, by pushing down on it, it's increasing the pressure on the inside. With an increase in pressure, we get a decrease in volume of the balloon. Or conversely, when the syringe piston was pulled back up and decreased the pressure on the inside of the container, we got an increase in volume 
of the balloon. When we have one thing that goes up and the other thing that goes down, we call that an inversely proportional relationship. In other words, the pressure is proportional, that's a proportionality symbol, to the inverse of the volume. So pressure is inversely proportional to volume. I don't know why I didn't use variables there. Save myself some scratchy scratchy. Okay, let's look at the next variable relationship. So let's look at pressure and moles of a gas in our next video. check the pressure. I got about four PSI, so I add a little bit more. Okay, so he's trying to get his soccer ball to like the ideal pressure at which one would want to play soccer with it. I have no idea what that pressure is. So he wants to increase the pressure inside that container. And it's a fixed-sided container for the most part. I know soccer balls can stretch a little bit, but imagine it's got fixed sides. So we're not changing volume here. The soccer ball is the size that it is. He wants to create more pressure on the inside. What has he attached here? A pump, an air pump. What's he doing to increase that pressure? He's adding more gas. Now I'm up at, ooh, just about nine, so that's good. Okay, there we go. We won't, apparently nine PSI is the, right, is the right pressure for inside a soccer ball. Sorry, all you soccer players, but I don't know that. Okay, so what we just saw, you guys, was the relationship between pressure and moles of a gas this time. Oh gosh, I didn't leave myself very much room. Okay, so in order to increase the pressure inside the soccer ball, we need to increase the moles of gas inside that soccer ball. And you could hear that when he accidentally sort of let his finger off and some of those moles of gas escaped, when you get a decrease in moles of gas, you're going to get a decrease in pressure. This variable relationship right here is different than our pressure volume relationship. Here, when one thing goes up and the other thing goes down, you've got an inversely proportional relationship. With pressure and moles, when one goes up, the other goes up. This is a directly proportional relationship. Pressure is proportional to moles of gas. Oh my God, here I go again, not using variables. Pressure is directly proportional to moles. Let's take a look at what happens with temperature in a video that I um, do not condone or uh, recommend you guys try at home. All right, so this girl decided to show us the pressure and temperature relationship by heating a can of soda. So we know that um, in a soda can, you've got dissolved CO2. You've also got some CO2 up above the liquid. And of course, the more that we heat the soda, the more CO2 is going to leave solution and um, you know, be in the gas phase up above the solution. And of course, as we heat the moles of gas up here at the top of the can, what do we think is gonna happen to the pressure on the inside of that can? Well, you already know. Oh, crap. Yeah, oh, crap. Okay, so what have we learned? 
back to our notes. What we just learned here is that when you increase temperature, you're going to get an increase in pressure. You increase pressure when temperature increases. And of course, they increased the temperature so much that they exceeded the pressure limit on the can and the can exploded. If you were to cool the gas, you would end up with a decrease in pressure. So what we have here is another directly proportional relationship. Pressure is directly proportional to temperature. Directly proportional. Okay, you guys. What I've got here are four, no, not four. I have three, I can count. I have three variable relationships here. So let's combine these. Like let's go ahead and derive a gas law from this. If pressure is proportional to all of these things, the inverse of volume, moles and temperature, we can just put those things together in an equation. I can put moles and temperature on the top. And of course the inverse of the volume would be one over the volume. Pressure is proportional to moles times temperature over volume. Let's get all of this, um, let's, I don't like stuff in the denominator. So let's go pressure times volume is proportional to moles times temperature. Now here's the thing, proportional does not mean equal to. It means related. Well, related by what? Like the pressure times volume does not equal the exact number that the moles times the temperature will be. However, if you were to measure like a hundred different scenarios of pressure, volume, moles, and temperature, like a hundred different samples of gas at different pressure, volume, moles, and temperature conditions, this number or this product and this product are always gonna be off from one another by the exact same amount, by a constant. And so that's how constants are found, you guys. Like we actually just measure, you know, a million different scenarios over and over and over again to find out how much they are off by. And so the constant that we are going to insert into our equation, don't ask why we put it between the N and the T, but that's where we put it, maybe because NERT sounds better than current, whatever. The R goes there. This right here is our ideal gas constant. And this, of course, right here is our ideal gas law. Okay? Now, what is this value for R? Well, it depends what units of measurement you used in these, you know, hundreds of experiments that you did. If you used liters to measure volume, atmospheres to measure pressure, moles to measure the amount of gas you had present, and Kelvin to measure temperature, the value for the ideal gas constant would be 0 0.0821. In other words, in order to use this equation, you guys, and to use this constant, you have to be in liters, atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin. Later on, I'm gonna introduce you guys to some other values for R. R can be measured using different things, um, different units. But for now, whenever we use the ideal gas law, we need to be in these units. And that is the only tricky thing about these ideal gas law problems. It's not even, I would argue that it is not tricky at all. So let's go ahead and use it. Let's use the ideal gas law to do a practice problem. And feel free to, you know, sort of pause and write down what you need to write down for the problem. I'm just going to sort of drive on as if you guys um, already have this written down. Okay. I'm getting my scroller working. There we go. All right. So here's my problem. I've got some calcium carbonate and it's decomposing into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. The sample of carbon dioxide is decomposing. No, the sample of calcium carbonate is decomposing. And we're collecting this CO2 
in a 250 milliliter flask, okay? Now listen, you guys, some of these problems are gonna be super easy and straightforward. And for others, it's gonna be a lot more complicated. So please, 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 when in doubt, write it out, okay? Can you please just like write down your knowns and unknowns or draw yourself a little diagram? All right, so here we go. I've got a flask and it is 250 milliliters. That's clearly my volume. When the reaction is complete, the pressure inside of this flask is equal to 1.3 atmospheres. Oof, you know what, you guys, I do not like how I wrote, um, I don't like how I wrote volume variable on the right. I want it on the left. All right, here we go. Volume is equal to 250 milliliters, nice and consistent. And the temperature when the reaction is complete is 31 degrees Celsius. Okay, so like we had some solid and we heated it, heat, and it made some gas, made some CO2. And so the gas occupied all 250 milliliters. The pressure inside of here was 1.3 and the temperature was 31 degrees Celsius. So the question is, well, how many moles of CO2 did we make? That's what we want to know. So obviously I'm gonna use Pivnart. But remember, in order to use Pivnart, I need to be in liters, atmospheres, and Kelvin. So I gotta take this guy to liters. I'm good here in atmospheres. Gotta take this guy to Kelvin. So what is that? 304. I can't do math in my head. Don't hate me. Oh, look, it's 304. And now we can plug and chug. PV equals NRT. Moles is going to be pressure, volume, over RT. Watch your units cancel out. 1.3 atmospheres, 0 0.250 liters, 0 0.08 to one liters atmospheres, moles, and Kelvin. I know some of you guys are gonna fight me. You're gonna fight me and you're not gonna do your units. You're gonna get something wrong because you're gonna make a stupid mistake and I'm not gonna feel bad for you. Nope, 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 I'm not. All right, plug and chug 1.3 times 0.25 divided by 0 0.0821 divided by 304 and I get 0, 1, 3 moles of what? CO2. Double check, make sure your units canceled, right? Atmospheres, bye-bye. Liters, bye-bye. Kelvin, bye-bye. Oh, look, we solved for moles. Now, what I would love for you guys to recognize here is that with this ideal gas law, we are now gonna be able to work with moles and volume of gases when we are not at STP. So do you guys remember we said that like one mole of any gas is equal to 22.4 liters. Like we had this mole volume conversion factor, but that was only true at STP, which was zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. So like I was not able to take this volume and simply use this conversion factor to get moles of CO2. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it because I wasn't at STP. My pressure was 1.3 atmospheres and my temperature was at 304 Kelvin, which is 31 degrees Celsius, not zero degrees Celsius. So what Pivnert allows me to do, in addition to this sort of simple little problem, is that it's gonna allow me to do some stoichiometry, right? So in fact, let's do another problem. I didn't write this one out, but like, let's do another problem. Let's say that like 10 grams of this calcium carbonate decomposes. And let's say that it decomposes again at like this pressure and temperature, okay? If 10 grams of calcium carbonate decomposes under these pressure and temperature conditions, I want to know what is the maximum volume of CO2 that I can produce. 
right? And I want to know this volume at 31 degrees Celsius and 1.3 atmospheres, okay? I'm not at STP here. So let's just squish this other problem in up here. Let's go 10 grams of calcium carbonate. Of course, I need to use my molar mass, one mole of calcium carbonate. I want to say it's 100 grams. Oh, you know, I think it's like 101. Aren't you impressed, you guys, that like I know the molar mass of this? No, I think it's 100.1. It's because like for that chalk lab that we do where we write our name on the board, <laughs> we use calcium carbonate. Anyway, that's another reason I know that. Okay. And then our mole ratio between the calcium carbonate, one mole of calcium carbonate, will make one mole of CO2. Now here is maybe where you guys were tempted to just go ahead and plug in, you know, one mole equals 22.4 liters. But of course we can't do that, right? Because we are not at STP. So I'm going to stop my stoichiometry right there. I'm going to stop my dimensional analysis and calculate moles. So 10 times 1 times 1 divided by 100.1, and I get 0 0.0999 moles of CO2. And now I can use PIVNERT to calculate what that volume would be. Volume equals NRT over P. So my moles in this case, 0 0.0999 moles. scroll all over the place times 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres moles Kelvin my temperature was 31 degrees Celsius which we said was 304 Kelvin divided by the pressure which was 1.3 atmospheres all right so what's the volume going to be this time like how Big a flask would I need to have that pressure or you know maybe it's easier to think about it as like this time we're collecting it in a balloon right like how big would that balloon be so 0 0.0999 times 0 0.0821 times 304 divided by 1.3 I would get 1.92 liters of CO2 Okay, so that was a totally separate problem. I literally just made up another problem using some of the conditions and the same reaction from the previous problem. Okay, but point being here. Let's put our final point in pink. PV equals NRT. Okay, allows us to predict pressure, volume, moles, or temperature under any sorts of conditions. And this is called our ideal gas law. And unfortunately, we're going to have to manipulate it when gases are not behaving ideally. But we'll save that for another day. And we will use this in stoichiometric calculations. I mean, it doesn't have to be a stoic problem, but we can use it um, in stoichiometric calcs that are not at STP. And hello, ever wonder where the 22.4 liters comes from? Look, if we were at STP, calculate the volume for one mole of any gas. These units are taking me forever at standard temperature and pressure conditions, right? One mole at standard temperature and standard pressure, guess what this number is gonna be? You're so smart. Hmm, okay. Anyway, moving on, shall we? We shall. Let's talk about the combined gas law. Okay. So we can actually, um, just like we derived the ideal gas law, we can derive the combined gas law as well from the ideal gas law. 
So the ideal gas law says PV equals NRT. And you're like, yeah, 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 I know. Well, remember, R is a constant, which means that the proportion of pressure and volume to moles and temperature will always be the same value, right? Because all of these things are related to each other. So they're all going to change proportionally or inversely proportionally to one another. So this will always be constant. In other words, if we have one set of pressure, volume, moles, and temperature conditions, they will always be equal to another set, a different set of pressure, volume, moles, and temperature conditions. Boom, there it is. That right there, my friends, is the combined gas law. Now, a lot of the times you're gonna see this equation written without the moles because a lot of the problems that we're gonna be working with are gonna be taking place inside closed containers. And if it's a closed container that doesn't open and release any of the sample, your moles at the beginning and at the end are going to be the same. Okay, so you will also see this equation written as P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, which is another version of the combined gas law. And frankly, you guys, if any of these variables remain the same start to finish, like let's say moles didn't change and temperature didn't change. If moles don't change and temperature doesn't change, you don't even have to worry about moles and temperature. You just have P1 V1 equals P2 V2. That silly little gas law has its own name after the guy who discovered the relationship between pressure and volume. This is called Boyle's Law. And there's a bunch of other ones too, like there's one for pressure and temperature and for volume and temperature and for volume and moles. Like, you know, you don't need to know them all, um, but you'll see them in your book. Okay, so there's Boyle's Law, there's Charles Law, there's Avogadro's Law. You can guess that that guy is going to be one that has moles in it. And there's the gay Lusac Law. And frankly, I always get a lot of them confused. I never confuse Boyle's. That's like the most famous one. Um, I think Charles is pressure and temperature. Avogadro's obviously has the moles in it. Whatever. You don't need to know them. You'll see them in your textbook. Um, the point being, the ideal gas law gives you the combined gas law. And the combined gas law is good for when you have changing conditions. Okay, so we use the ideal gas law when we only have one set of conditions and nothing is changing. We're not changing temperature. We're not changing pressure. We just want to know like, hey, if this is the pressure, what's the volume going to be? But here, if we ever need to make predictions as things change during a reaction or whatever we're doing, we need to be able to predict what the new pressure or volume or temperature is going to be. So that's where we're going to use the combined gas law. Now you'll notice that R, the constant, is not in here. So you might think, huh, doesn't matter what unit I'm in as long as I'm in the same unit on both sides. That is true. However, temperature must always be in Kelvin. It doesn't matter if you're in Celsius on the left and Celsius on the right. Your temperature has to be in Kelvin. T always in Kelvin. Because remember what we were talking about yesterday about Celsius going negative? You can't have negatives in these proportional relationships here. It screws up all the math. We have to have an absolute temperature. Okay. So that's why you have to be in Kelvin. Frankly, I always just work in the standard units. All right. Because then you just don't want to make any stupid mistakes later when you're using Pivner and you got to be in those units. But if you insist, you know, if you're in Tors on the left and Tors on the right, you want to leave it in Tor, that's fine. But make sure you always convert your temperature to Kelvin. Okay, there, I've said it enough times. All right, let's do a problem, shall we? We'll do a problem and then one more gas law. Okay, so the problem we're looking at here looks kind of complicated. You just got a lot of words. Let's read it and draw a diagram, right? Like when in doubt, draw it out. So let's do that. An inflated balloon has a volume of six liters at sea level, one atmosphere. And 
we let that balloon rise. Okay, so like this is situation number one. It's going to be like our V1 and our P1. And we let that balloon rise up into the atmosphere. This is going to be my situation number two. Until the pressure drops to 0.45 atmospheres. And during that ascent, the temperature also drops from 22 degrees Celsius. So down here, it's 22 degrees Celsius. And as it rises up here, the temperature also drops to negative 21 degrees Celsius. What is the final volume going to be? Oh, this isn't the hard problem I was thinking about. Whatever. Diagrams never hurt you. There's a harder problem later when we're doing gas density. This is very simple, you guys. All we got to do is plug and chug into P1, P1 over T1. No change in moles. The balloon is sealed. P2, V2 over T2. And let's make sure that we're in the right units. Okay, so we got to take our degrees Celsius into Kelvin. So 22 plus 273. We're going to be working with 295 Kelvin here. And we got to take this guy, negative 21 plus 273. We're working with 252 Kelvin over here. So my initial pressure is 6 liters. My initial volume, oh sorry, my initial, I did volume first. It doesn't matter. My initial pressure is 1 atmosphere. My initial volume is 6 liters. And my initial temperature is 295 Kelvin. My reduced pressure up at the higher atmosphere is 0.45 atmosphere. We want to know what that volume is going to be if in addition to dropping in pressure, we also drop in temperature. So go ahead and solve for the volume of the balloon at that higher altitude. I got a new volume of 11.4 liters. Is that what you guys got? Should we check the book to make sure I didn't make any dumb mistakes? Did I even pick this problem from the book? That would be good if I did. Yeah, 11 liters. Okay, so that problem wasn't very hard. Let's do one more. Um, let's do one more derivation, shall we? Let's get one more equation. So we've got our ideal gas law. We've got our combined gas law. We can do another manipulation of Pivnert to learn about density. So let's look at Pivnert. Like, you know, how do I get this to tell me about density? Well, density, remember, you guys, is mass and volume. So you're like, okay, well, like, here's volume. I don't see mass anywhere in this equation. But the thing that relates the most to mass would be moles, right? Because that's an amount. So let's get moles over volume. You know, it's not going to be mass over volume, but like let's at least get moles over volume. So I'm going to get P is equal to NRT over V. Now let's get N over V by itself, right? So N over V, because that's going to be the density that I'm looking for here. N over V is going to be equal to P over RT. And you're like, yeah, okay, Mr. Vera, but moles over volume, like moles per liter, is not density. We need grams. Well, how do we turn moles into mass? Like, how would we convert moles of a gas into a mass of a gas? Oh, that's right, everybody. We would multiply by molar mass, right? Because molar mass is grams per mole. So if we multiply by molar mass on this side, grams per mole, my moles cancel and I'm left with grams over liters, okay? That'll give me my density. But if I multiply by molar mass on this side, I need to multiply by molar mass on that side, right? So this right here, you guys, gives me the density of the gas, right? Because molar mass times moles gives me grams over volume, which gives me liters. 
That's my density. So density is going to be equal to the molar mass of the gas times the pressure over RT. I don't know why I put a dot for the multiply sign there. Whatever. Doesn't matter. I guess I should just be consistent and I'm using it. All right, so the molar mass times the pressure over R times T. This right here. Oh, have I been putting boxes around my equations? I hope so. Oh yeah, I have been. Okay. All right, so we can um, calculate density of gases using the ideal gas law as well, right? Make a little note, if you don't remember what MM is, that is my weird abbreviation for molar mass. I actually don't think it's mine. I think everybody uses that. Okay. Here is the big annoying problem that I wanted to end class with. Let's do it. When in doubt, we draw it out. A large evacuated flask. Evacuated just means empty. There's my empty flask, nothing in it. Has a mass equal to 134.567 grams. I don't even know where this problem's going yet, but it's got a lot of words, so I'm gonna start drawing. When the flask is filled with a gas of unknown molar mass, okay, so we're filling up this gas, no, we're filling up this flask with a gas, and I don't know the molar mass. The pressure inside of here is 735.4. And the temperature inside of here is 31 degrees Celsius. And its mass now It's 137.456 grams. Okay, so this mass was when it was empty, right? So that's just sort of the mass of the flask itself, okay? And um, so I can subtract these two values to get just the mass of the gas by itself. So the mass of the gas would be 130. 7.456 uh, minus 134.567. So we get a mass of gas inside of there as 2.889 grams. Okay? So in order to get molar mass, right, molar mass is equal to grams per mole. Hey, look, you guys, we already have grams. We already have our numerator. We know the mass of the gas inside of this sample. We know the mass of this sample inside of this flask. What I need to know is how many moles of gas is that in order to get the molar mass, right? How many moles are in there? Well, check it out. I have pressure and temperature. Hmm, maybe I can use Pivnart. PV equals NRT, right? Can I calculate moles? I know the pressure. I know the temperature. Oh, crap. They didn't tell me. They didn't tell me the volume of this flask. They just said it was large. Yuck. So I can't use this yet. Ah, but if I keep reading my problem, hmm, check this out. When the flask is evacuated again... Oh gosh, how annoying is this? The flask is emptied out again, and then it's filled with water at 31 degrees Celsius. Now it has a mass of 1067.9 grams. Ay, ay, ay. So I can subtract from that 134.567 grams. That's just the mass of the empty flask to get the mass of the water in there. Where do you think I'm heading with this, you guys? I'm trying to figure out the volume of this stupid flask, which wouldn't it have been nice if they just told us the volume of the flask? But no. All right, so how much water is in this darn thing? 933.333 grams of water. Well, that's great. That's the mass of the water. Luckily, they gave us the density of the water. So 
so that we can figure out the volume. This many grams per one milliliter. Okay, so we can use this now. I probably have to scroll. Hopefully I haven't gone off screen for you guys. Oh gosh, I can't go any lower. I'm gonna have to go up. All right, I'm gonna go up this way here with this answer. So divide by 0.997. That is going to be 936 milliliter flask. Because that's, you know, how many milliliters of water we have. So that's the size of the flask. Ugh, it's the volume we needed to calculate moles. Phew, let's take it to liters. 0.936 liter flask. All right. So... Again, because I've run out of room, my apologies. I have to keep going upwards here. We're going into PIVNART to figure out moles. NRT. So N is going to be PV over RT. The pressure inside of that thing was 735 torr. Oh, for the love of God. Now I've got to convert that to atmospheres. 760 tor in one atmosphere. Let's do my conversion within my equation here. My volume was 0.936 liters. My ideal gas constant, 0 0.0821 liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. I have no idea what the temperature was. Was it 31 degrees Celsius? So 31 degrees Celsius plus 273 will give me my Kelvin. Okay, let's calculate moles. 735 divided by 760 times 0.996 divided by 0 0.0821 divided by my temperature. I get moles of that sample being 0 0.0363 moles. That is not what the problem was asking me for. So I don't know why I'm putting a box around it. I'm going to use this. We're going to go back in this direction. I'm going to use this here, voila, to get molar mass, right? Remember, molar mass is grams per mole. My grams is 2.889 grams of gas. My moles is 0 0.0363 moles, which gives me 2.889 divided by 0 0.0363 gives me a molar mass of 79.6 grams per mole. Boom. Is that the right answer? Yes, it is. Is anybody wondering why I just did this whole big problem and I didn't use that density equation that we just derived up here, right? Like I didn't use, the, I, like I gave you a density equation that had molar mass in it and then I didn't use that equation. There are so many different ways you guys can solve these problems. Th because all of these problems, all of these variable relationships tie back to PIVNERT, you can use PIVNERT, which is kind of what I did. Right? I said, ah, oh, screw that. I know molar mass is grams per mole. I've got grams. Let's find moles. Boom. Let's figure it out. But like, could I have just used this problem and solved for molar mass? Yeah, I could have, right? It would have required me to solve for the density of the gas, right? Like I would have had to have taken this mass of gas and divided it by the volume of the container to solve for the density and then plug in pressure and temperature and R. And I would have gotten the same answer. Should I prove it to you? You can stop the video if you want to, I suppose. Let's prove it to ourselves. All right, so the density of the gas would be the mass of the gas, which was what? 2.889. Okay, so 2.889 grams over 
the volume, which we decided was 0.9, 0.936 liters. So there's my density. Molar mass, I don't know. Pressure was the 735 torr, which of course we have to convert to atmospheres. Okay, over 0 0.0821 liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin, times my temperature, which was 31 plus 273, which was 304 Kelvin. All right, let's, let's solve for molar mass here. Aha, uh -huh. look at that. I got a molar mass. I always get worried when I do everything in the once with the calculator. I got a molar mass equal to 79.7. Now, units here, you don't have to take my word for it that you're going to get grams per mole, right? Like, look, liters are going to cancel with liters. Atmospheres will cancel with atmospheres. We already canceled the tor and the conversion. Kelvin cancels with Kelvin, and we're left with grams and moles. Grams per mole. So like I could have used that density equation to get molar mass. I could have used Pivnert, how I did it here. We get the same thing, 79.7, 79.6, close enough. All right, I'm sure I've assigned some practice problems somewhere on your schedule. Go do those practice problems. Next week, we'll do a ton of practice and add in some more gas laws. Good job.